this content is from MTNL Public Care, which is a local care practice in town. Um, actually, I think MTNL is more than just Halifax, and they're all over the region and maybe even in uh, central Canada as well. A former employer of mine. Um, anyway, over the last decade, Kevin has become a leader in defining and implementing online engagement and digital advocacy. He's considered an industry expert in social media strategies, online campaigns, audience recruitment and engagement, and has expert knowledge of web production planning, design and development. As Senior Vice President, first with Grassroots Enterprise, and then later with Edelman, which is one of the largest PR firms in the world, both in Washington, uh, D.C., he led award-winning digital strategy, social media, and persuasive communications efforts for many clients, including the launching of compelling online campaigns for Fortune 100 corporations, national nonprofits, and the United States and Canadian governments. Over the course of his career, Kevin has worked with the Canadian Embassy, Medtronic, Sierra Club, the Campaign for Tobacco for Kids, Pfizer, Visa, American Heart Association, Progressive Majority, Medicare, and many, many, many others. One of Kevin's personal projects was to found Fair Deal for Newfoundland, one of the most successful online grassroots, grassroots movements in Canadian history. For this work, he was interviewed on the Global Mail, CBC, CTV, Radio, and others, and won the 2006 Polly Award. Born and raised in St. John's, perhaps why he was able to do such a great job on that campaign. He's a regular speaker on grassroots online movement building and social media engagement in both the United States and Canada, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Oh my God, that was a long bio, so I'm going to like cut that right down. Um, three bullets. I apologize for that. Uh, okay, so me and a nutshell. Set up here. If I'm walking here, I try and move around so different people can see the screen. I don't, I can't move a lot, so I don't want to uh, kind of block off when I'm shot. Okay, so I'm Kevin. In a nutshell, um, I'm from um, from Newfoundland, and uh, like many Newfoundlanders, I called call Japan. I went to Japan to teach English, and was a teacher there for a long time. Then I moved to the United States. Uh, I was in Washington D.C. up until for about a decade, up until last year. Uh, there I did digital advocacy, digital strategy work. Uh, and I moved back here a year ago, and now I work at MTNL, public relations. I did catch that baby, so the baby's fine. I might throw a baby in during the session just to see if you're paying attention. If you can be a baby, I'll throw it. Okay, so this is a slightly different presentation for me, because uh, some of you saw the, the recreation one. Um, just so a note on the organization of it. First, uh, Keith and, and uh, Clemad is not here to listen to us throughout the whole thing. Not going to bother me at all. Uh, also, interrupt me and, and uh, uh, gesticulate wildly if you want to, if you to ask a question. Is that cool? I have a, I think it's going to talk for about 30 minutes. I have a really bad habit of trying to do a lot of slides in a ridiculously short amount of time. And the joke is usually like, oh, I have 172 slides in, in 30 minutes. Actually, I have 57 slides, so that's actually quite a bit in 30 minutes. So I'm going to go really fast, but stop me. And if I want to skip a slide in the middle, I'm going, I'll say, you know, this doesn't make sense. So um, I kind of reorganized my typical kind of digital strategy presentation because we sent like 14 or 15 questions. So I try to hit those throughout my talk, either literally or, or just generally. The other thing I try to do is, uh, uh, so at the end of it, um, if there's no talk, talking throughout, and it's just me talking, I'll stick around and have a discussion. Does that make sense? Does that sound like a good plan? Interrupt me at all. So the thing I want to start with is basically the world, like kind of the world view. I hate starting with tactics. I hate starting any kind of, I wouldn't do that with a client conversation. I wouldn't uh, kind of come into a room and say, let's start a Facebook page or let's start a Twitter page. So a lot of your questions yesterday were like, okay, how do I start on social media? So if you're dealing with a uh, certain kind of strategist or a PR firm, or, or with me, for example, uh, as, as someone who's helping you figure things out, I would challenge you on that immediately and say, what are you trying to do? And so that's how I'm kind of starting my talk. Uh, we'll get to tactics. The thing to accept before we get to tactics, and probably the reason that you're all here, is that uh, everyone is, in fact, a media. Do folks recognize who this is? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so uh, Dave Carroll uh, is the lead singer of Sons of Maxwell, and um, which is a band that plays in pubs on the street and all over, all over town. A local guy in, uh, in 
about 2006, I think, he looked out the window and saw uh, United Airlines throwing these guitars around. When he got off the plane, his guitar was broken. He created a YouTube video called United Breaks Guitars. For me, this was great because I was in Washington and I'm seeing friends were coming up behind me. And because I'm from Newfoundland, people automatically think I'm from Nova Scotia if you're American. So they say, someone's from your part of the world. And the first thing I would say is like, no, I'm actually from Newfoundland. And then, and then the other, and, and, and they ignore that, and then, then they move on and say, look, there's a video, and then I pay attention. And it, so there's a, mil, a million hits of a video that a guy produced in, you know, with no budget, basically, called United Breaks Guitars. And why this was so interesting is up to uh, three months after the event, if you Google United Airlines anywhere in the world, the number three hit on Google was United Breaks Guitars. So the assault on the reputation of one of the biggest airlines in the world occurred from a little bar, um, a, a guy that plays in bars in Halifax. So the point of that case study is that everyone is, is the media. And so the reason why I think you're here and the reason why you know, your world view should kind of change, uh, if it isn't there yet, and why you should be thinking about digital strategy, is so to accept that piece for <coughs> We all have uh, our own networks, and we're all influential in our own networks. There isn't a barrier to publishing. I can publish right now from my phone in my pocket. Right? That, I can tweet. It doesn't mean that I will influence a lot of people, but there is no barrier to publish. So because of that, there's this other state that's in our society called continuous partial attention. It's actually a psychological term that was coined in 1976. Uh, this forward thinker psychologist. And what they mean by that is, you know, there's this state of being where we're all kind of constantly distracted by the amount of media that we consume. So, you know, as I talk, I'm kind of always thinking about checking my email because I can't. And it's in my phone and this wonderful little computer that's in my pocket that didn't exist 10 years ago and was science fiction 25 years ago. It was science fiction 15 years ago. Um, and because of the ubiquitous ability we have to uh, consume media, we're always constantly distracted. So I'm, I go to uh, my, see my kids on the playground, I'm checking my phone at the same time, and I'm I have this continuous partial attention. Does that make sense to you? Have you ever been in a meeting where someone's checking their email and they're like, geez, put your phone down? That's what continuous partial attention is. Um, how many people check their email before they get out of bed? It's like me. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people do. Uh, uh, Nokia did a uh, study this year and something like 36% of their phone users before they get out of bed kind of reach over and check their phone. I'm kind of in the business where I need to, but um, that's how kind of ubiquitous and um, there is this deluge of data in a world of continuous partial attention where we're kind of always kind of addicted to checking, checking. And if we're all, um, if you're with me so far, we've kind of accepted that we're all um, our own media outlets. There, everyone is the, is the media, there is no barrier to publishing. That results in a deluge of information because everyone can publish. It also results in devices in our pockets and on our computer screens that are always giving us this data. Um, so we're always kind of distracted. Um, and, and thus we have an audience of audiences. So if you show this, this is a, a, a university classroom, I think, in um, somewhere at an average university in Massachusetts. And all the, all the students are kind of online, barely paying attention. Um, the funny thing about that is, you know, these devices and the ability to check these devices are always are only going to get better and quicker and more um, more everywhere. And our brains are not going to go up. Our brains are kind of finite. An evolution of our brain does not happen as quick as the evolution of a microchip. So, what that results in, like if you're with me with all these statements so far, I think it's a reasonably compelling case. Is that you're you've got this scenario where it's never been harder to uh, get through, get your voice, uh, get your message out. It's never been harder to organize parents to pay attention to your message about supporting. Uh, but at the same time, it's never been easier. It's a it's a funny paradox. And it's why, I, you know, personally, quite honestly, it's why I love working on the web. It's an interesting challenge. It's never been easier to create interesting content and get it out there and bypass newspapers and things like that um, because they don't hold the keys anymore. But because everyone is so distracted, it's never harder to get people to pay attention. Does that make sense? That's inherently, that's inherently the issue with social media, the issue and the opportunity. Um, 
so kind of stepping back, you know, when, when, when you ask the question of what's the first thing I start with, the first thing you start with is kind of acceptance at a senior level that that is the case. And acceptance that we're moving from distributing messages, we're, we're less concerned with, okay, here's my message, here's my press release, here's my message, here's my, you know, here it is in a contained box, I'm going to control it and push it out, and everyone will read it. It's less about that and more about kind of nurturing uh, connection. It's nothing to do anymore with necessarily managing traditional media. It's called traditional media, though that's still important. It's more about uh, recognizing that everyone is the, is the media, and everyone is kind of their own media outlet, and everyone is influential in their own network. Engagement is the target instead of just media, and instead of pushing message, you're, you're, you want to engage in uh, pushing for actions. And Facebook, <coughs> people like things, that's known as interaction in my, in my business. You want interactions, you, you don't want impressions. The impressions are so good. So that's how I view the world. So I always kind of want to start with that, kind of lay out how I view the world. And if you're working with someone like me in, in terms of your communication challenge, I think it helps you to know where I'm coming from. <laughs> Not that we're working together, right? But uh, I think that's where a lot of people in my business are coming from. And I think that's where you should come from as your first step if you're thinking about the digital strategy, thinking about building one. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. The second part is around the actual components and pieces of the digital strategy. And I tried to, I actually ch changed this up a little bit last night to try and address some of your questions better. And the way I've organized it, are, there are five different things. Uh, that you start with. Story is the first one. S shareable social objects, which is kind of a long way of saying really shareable things. Things that are truly useful, which is a great, um, uh, ridiculously obvious statement. <laughs> I, I can see that. But things that are truly useful. Um, the embracing of data and what we call story touch points. I'm going to talk about each of these things. I'm going to give you a proof point to why they work and why they matter. And that's kind of the structure of the rest of my thought. And then I actually have some of your questions on the screen and we can go through them. But stop me either way. So I said uh, from the beginning, I don't like starting with tactics. The thing I like to start with is story. And here's my first little case study for that. So one of the biggest things I worked on this year in terms of the amount of time I, I thought about it um, was uh, <coughs> ship start here, the ship's campaign. The, the, uh, National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy. Do you recognize that image by any chance? Mm -hmm. So, so here's the here's the challenge with that. Here's my story on that. So around April or so, we get a call from the client saying, um, uh, you know, here's the problem. The problem is that there's a, there's this NSPS. Uh, and, and what is NSP? The National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy. I have recently moved back to Halifax. I'm vaguely aware that ships are actually built here. That's that's where that's my starting point. Okay, and so the, the client has to explain this to me and say everyone needs to know, everyone needs to buy in. Um, this will be uh, uh, kind of an inherently closed door decision in the prime minister's office. Uh, we need to kind of figure out how we can help influence that. We need to demonstrate community um, interest in this. And so the default client uh, response is okay. We need to um, we need to put. Uh, we need to, to tell people about NSPS in all the ways that we know how. We need a media advisory, we need a press release, we need all that kind of stuff. We need to tell people about the national ship building procurement strategy. That, I think that would, be, would have been a really bad idea. <laughs> my initial counsel to the client. Just telling people about this thing that the client really thinks is very, very important is in general, um, if you do it literally, is the hard way, it, it, it can be perilous. The thing that the point I'm trying to make with story is that um, a story is what lets people connect with uh, your message. The story is literally NSPS is really important. And you're all familiar with NSPS at this point, right? National Shipbuilding, the Irving thing, the you know, um, And that's um, telling the story literally is vital. Telling the story creatively is more vital because people are so distracted. We had this great moment in, a, in our office where we were thinking, you know, what is the story that we're going to go to market with? What, what is the story that we're trying to tell to make people care about the shipbuilding procurement strategy? And a great moment was when someone kind of picked up in my team 
we're having a brainstorm. There's about four or five people around the room. And I said, God, you know, the blue nose is on the dime. That's really interesting. Why is that really interesting? Well, if it's on the national currency, it's kind of a, a really good tangential statement to say, you know, Canada put the blue nose on the currency. That's how important uh, shipbuilding is that comes from here to Canada. Also, the bid had to demonstrate Canadian impact, uh, positive Canadian impact from an economic point of view. It's on the currency. That's also kind of a tangential good story to tell. So what came out of that is not NSBS is really important. It's not the economic impact of national shipbuilding procurement strategy would result in 54 barbers needed and 25 billion. It's not any of that. It's we don't build ships, we build icons. We get that story right, that becomes the heart of the digital campaign. So before we start to think about digital, we nail the story. Um, and that's one example of, I think, a good story that was, that was at the heart of the whole thing. This underpins all of the other messages. And all the, there are going to be a lot of messages, because there are Twitter messages, and Facebook messages, and email messages, and newspaper messages, and talking points, and speaking, speaking notes, and all that stuff. The heart, the story is where you start. I think before you start digital. If there wasn't a good story, you wouldn't have had this kind of uptick. Um, have you seen the lawn signs? <laughs> Probably. Um, so Irving created all the lawn signs. Uh, the original tactic. So an interesting point on this. I want. I was a strong advocate for going the lawn sign route. Typically a political campaign thing because I wanted all of the Irving employees to put them on their lawns. They're about 2,000. 1500 at any given time. And I thought that they would do that because if you work at the yard, um, this is a point of pride. You know, you, you could say to, that picture with the dime is actually a shipyard worker. We, we, said, we, we said to the shipyard, like, give us, you know, give us somebody with really rough hands. And they immediately said, Kenny, <laughs> out of like 1500 people. <laughs> Kenny came to our office and we took that photo and then we, you know, made the ad and got the, you know, got the story right. And so if you've got guys like Kenny who, um, who we met, who are buying into the story, then lawn signs, you know, we get 2,000 lawn signs around, around the region. That's what I wanted to do. Then I said, okay, Irving, whenever you give one out to uh, an employee, I want you, uh, you have to say, here's your lawn sign, now take a picture when you put it up and email it to the Ship Start Here campaign. Why did I do that? I wanted, like, something shareable. That was the, the digital Facebook piece. Um, and, and that wouldn't have happened unless you had the right story. Does that make sense? Uh, to be clear, I may have skipped this a little bit. All of these photos in the background are people that ended up doing that. They took a long time, they took a picture, and then they went to Facebook and posted it on Facebook. So we had several hundred people do that. Uh, and like about 7,000 all told people actually liking the, the Facebook page. I don't, I don't think that was possible without the story. This one in a nutshell is another pushing uh, uh, ships are here aside for a second. The second one is about, um, I worked for the Canadian government, and my job was to help organize Canadian, um, to make Canadian expats in the United States advocates for the Canadian government in the United States. So I was a Canadian expat uh, in the US for 10 years. Make people like me give their email address to the Canadian government so the Canadian government could send their messages from time to time. Because there was no email list of expats. So Ambassador McKenna actually said, you know, I, I, we don't have a database, we need someone to tell. So the story became something called Connect to Canada. And you can go to the Connect to Canada website, and this, this is a whole big campaign, but one of the things that you can do there is say, I'm an expat, I want to tell my story, and this is what I miss about Canada, this is what I do in the United States, this is my story. So I, you can go to Connect to Canada and submit your story. Simple tactic, so clear tactic here. Submitting your story on a website. When you get that data, you can approve it and say this is a great story and put it back on the website and other people can go there and find it. So that tactic is, you know, the story, the story piece of this is, you know, you get someone, Roseanne, in New York City going to a website, writing a couple of paragraphs saying why I'm in New York and what I miss about Canada. Then you can look at that database and say, you know, I've got this many storytellers in Virginia, this many in Washington, this many in New York. The digital tactic on that is it gives you things to go to bat with. It gives you, it gives you a story to work with. It gives you content. It also gives you things that you can use in traditional media. So, when someone from you know Virginia uh, said you know wants uh, Canadians view 
on an issue about uh, the border tax. You know, we have to pay $5 across the border now. There are reporters in Virginia that want a Canadian's view on that. We now have a database. And they can go there and see the story of the person. Does that make sense? So stories about you know getting the idea right to, to break through the din, the deluge, the distraction, but also that you can use it. Another one in that is a Canada Day across America. So uh, expats really love Canada Day because they, you know, so we put up a website based called Canada Day across America, which is again feeds the story. Um, go there, submit your submit that you're an expat in the United States having a party, and it puts a little balloon on a map. That's all the site does. It only does one thing. Um, that is again that again feeds the story. If you're all if you if you identify the story, uh, we build icon. Canada's network in the United States, then discovering tactics that lead the story become easier. One that's more relevant is I, I did something in 2009 and 2010 called Make 2009 Special, and it was actually the subway actually funded, funded it. Um, to get Special Olympics volunteers who had already volunteered to bring in other volunteers in Ontario, that was the whole campaign. The story was these volunteers often look back at their volunteer experience for Special Olympics and say, that was one of the most amazing things. It was a great life experience for me. And uh, so we created a website, Make 2009 Special. You can go there and submit your story, but basically you kind of cultivated who, what are the 10 best stories of volunteers in Ontario. Um, and and uh, then we expanded it across other provinces. Get these great stories from volunteers and then use them as a primary vehicle of interest. You can use that on Facebook, you can use that on Twitter, and you build you build them into that way. Okay, my final my final thought on the story um, is, is you know pretty clear right there. Information doesn't information is all people in Nova Scotia need to know about the national shipping procurement strategy. Inspiration is we build icons. But given your lunch, you probably recognize this symbol. So uh, I could be. And you're, are you from? Oh, well, I'm going to get quizzed already. You work. <laughs> so I'm going to mangle this for you. So here's what I know about this. Um, so during the, I think of the early 90, 1990s, uh, Subway was kind of going to bat with. Uh, and I didn't make this when we were here. Actually, I used this all the time. Subway um, didn't go to bat with. Uh, they went to, like their their key story message. Their key story was we can get seven subs at a very low uh, uh, calorie count and then you can lose weight. This is information. So uh, their sales, if you look at subway case studies, kind of stayed consistent throughout this. Who's that? So A, you know his name, right? Everybody knows his name. He's been working for subway like 17 years now, 13, 13 years. And um, people in my office have met him when he came to town. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. You A, you know his name. B. Um, if you look at when, when Subway started to use Jared, I think there's a, 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 a spike in sales. I don't know the number, and I'm reluctant to say it because Subway's in the room. <laughs> uh, but I know the spike has a beat yet. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, that, you know, that happened because Jared was the story. Like, I, I don't even know what the language is around that, but you look at Jared and you understand he's holding up the man that holds the pants. You, know, you, you fundamentally connect with um, and so that, that's my final point in the story. So um, the other thing, the other thing in my components here was <coughs> social objects. So you're saying, you know, what, you know, how do I get started on social media and what do I, you know, you kind of need really pithy, interesting things to share. Facebook and Twitter and it's really those are the big ones now are really they need you need pithy things that people find interesting and they're more inclined to share. They're shareable social objects is one of the funny ways to put it. A photo is one of those things. So in the SHIPS program, we uploaded all these photos from the archives and all these photos from Kirby. Uh, the Flickr, um, then we started telling those Scotians about it. So the social strategy there on Flickr was, let's create a really good online place where you can see really awesome photos of SHIPS. And uh, SHIPS being built both historically and modern times. The Flickr profile for SHIPS has been viewed something like 18 or 19,000 times. Like the, that's a lot of views. And we didn't do that much to it. People pass it around because it was inherently 
completely shareable. That's interesting because so many people viewed it. It's also interesting because I can upload a thousand photos and, and start, you know, on Facebook I could say, what do you think of this photo? Vote for your favorite photo. Um, this is really fascinating, here's why. And uh, then you can see the stats for each photo. I know that this is the most popular photo of the 18,000 views or something. This has by far the most views um, on Flickr. That instructs the campaign, right? Not everyone who visits the site sees that. I see that as the, the campaign or orchestrator. That instructs me that legacy matters in Nova Scotia. The second one is this one. That also instructs the campaign. So Flickr for me is really useful because inherently it's a place you can store photos that are really easily shareable and you can pull them into Facebook and things like that. But it also instructs the campaign in terms of what you know, people spend time looking at these. Which ones are they looking at? Maybe we should make an ad out of this image. That kind of thing. Does that make sense? Another, uh, uh, this was a funny anecdote. So, well, I think it's funny. 28th of April, uh, I was looking through the Nova Scotia archives for ships start here. It's kind of, because no one made it easy to kind of find these photos, right? So I was literally like, there's got to be photos. And I called the archives. And I found one that, you know, it, I was kind of a, a proof point in that case. I found it, and because I used Twitter, I found it, I thought it was really funny, and then I tweeted it. And I wouldn't have done that unless it was inherently shareable. So the Nova Scotia archives are wonderful. And they have all these great photos that we've never spent time there online. And this is the photo I found, which may be hard to, may be hard for you to see. These are all uh, gentlemen in 1931 attir uh, attending the Gay Senoritas Dance Night in April 1931, somewhere in Halifax. Um, I wasn't the first one that shared that photo. So for me, I, I was like, wait a minute, there's something wrong. These are all gentlemen in evening attire. Female evening. Why is it on? So there's this moment of interesting. Um, Nova Scotia Archives put it up because they, you know they want to get that they're you know mandated to do certain things, but also this is their most popular one of the most popular photos of all time on their website because uh, I talked to them afterwards. So like, yeah, you're not the first one to find that stuff. Here. So that was pretty cool. And a proof point of like why that's interesting. Do you know what an infographic is? Have you heard that word? So you've seen them. Uh, you just may not have heard the term. <clears throat> the Ship Start Here campaign started to uh, digitally take off in terms of views started to spike when we created an infographic. It's basically a really long image that dilutes um, the complex into really clear, shareable, pithy, visible ways. And the complex was a 130-page report done by the Conference Board of Canada talking about the economic impact of NSPS and why everyone here should care about it. 130-page report. Nobody will read a 130-page report. I, I, no, one, no one will read that. They're too distracted by other things and they don't have time. Some economists might read it at, at Dalhousie or other places. There's also a 10-page summary report. More people will read that than a 130-page report, but most people will ignore it. Because we live in a digital age, the highest uh, way, the best way to get people to read something that complex is to condense it into an infographic. And it's basically a really long JPEG with salient, pithy, visual points from the really complex thing that you want everyone to know about and making an image out of it, a JPEG, a photo. Um, because when you have that, you can, and social networks are, are, are about sharing. So you go to bat with that. You create this thing that's inherently shareable. You ask other people to share it. If it's interesting enough, they will, but it has to be interesting. If we said, oh, go share the 103 page report, no one would have. Thousands and thousands of people shared this. I don't know the exact number, but I did at one point. At one point, it was 5,200 or something like that. From the campaign perspective, I can track how many, if people use my source file, I can track how many people do it. So you've seen these things online. If you spend any time online, you know what I'm talking about. They look something like this, typically. I, um, one is about school, one is about uh, paying off your, your school debt. They're visually interesting, pithy things having to do with numbers that you really want your audience to know. And you want, it to know, you want them to know it so bad that somebody wrote a white paper. You want everyone to read it. They won't read it. They'll read it if you condense it and make it super easy for them. That makes sense? I'm talking pretty fast. Pretty hot here, too. Um, can I open that? Okay, so last night I was thinking about some of your other questions. You know, where do I start? 
And so I, I, you know, I haven't actually talked about this before. I have provided counsel to a seaport and farmer's market. I don't work on this behind the scenes. So you're thinking about your Facebook page. Um, uh, and I, I follow how that's work. Uh, my point on this is um, I follow this Facebook page in Halifax because it's really useful to me. I'm a fan of the market. I take my kids there. I buy stuff there. I follow it because it's useful. I don't really care about the story <laughs> too much about it, honestly. I think if the market was threatened and the market needed me to act, then a story is really important to get to motivate me to act. If the, you know, if the market was really threatened, the story will motivate me. Um, mainly, I just find this really uh, useful. I want to know what's happening. Is there a cruise ship in today? Is parking going to be a pain? Is there a pumpkin palooza fest or whatever the, it was? Um, so I follow that. And so my challenge to you, for those who ask, what do you do on Facebook? Like, what, what do you have that people want that is useful? That is a, if you think of the pie chart of content you post on Facebook, I think 70% of it is use, should be useful, and the other 30% should be your story. That reverses if you've got a threat, because a threat, when you need people to act, people are more, more, more motivated and you draw other people in if you've got a, a really compelling story like the, you know, we go by now. So I follow those guys for that reason. I also follow HR and Karen because um, I've got two kids and I'm like, I just moved here. I don't know what the hell's going on with my kids. What do I do on a snowy day? Where can I go? Is there, is there a kid festival somewhere? Um, and uh, last winter, I found out that there was a kid festival at MSVU. That's what it's called, Children's Festival. And I went there to the gym, and it was great. There was face painting. And I found out about it because they told me. So in, in, in an age of constant, constantly being distracted, it's really hard for me to go to Chronicle Herald or to go to um, MSVU site or, or how do I get that information? I'm, I'm, I'm a very distracted person with my phone all the time. The service that, that this site, HRN Parent, is providing me on Facebook is they're curating things for me. So if your um, you know, uh, sport is lacrosse, if your sport is, uh, if you're targeting parents that, uh, like me, are, today is a registration day in Halifax. So I, was, I made sure I, I got my kids in uh, some of the things at Chocolate Lake today. Um, I found out about that from a billboard, and I was, finding, I was thinking about this on the way here. It would have been really cool to find out about that on this site. They didn't post about it. Or some kind of generic, very useful place that had me in mind, that gave me information about when things, when I should register, when things are going to be canceled for snow. So, <coughs> again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, someone once said uh, to me, you're a great observer of the obvious and can. I don't know if it's, a, it's a, an, an insult to this day. I think it probably is. But it's so obvious, but sometimes really hard to do if you're in the trenches. Useful uh, has to be uh, a big part of your social approach. I lived by this site in Washington, and I, I can't unsubscribe to this day because I want to see what my friends are doing. There's, a move, there's, a, there's an organization called 35 Things to Do, and uh, they go around different US cities and they create Facebook pages. 35 Things to Do in DC. And some, you know, their first post, it's dark, it's early, that's their post. Uh, all told, they get like 14 or so interactions here. They get people commenting. That, that's not useful information. It's dark, it's early, but it's like a connected story thing. I'm from DC, you're from DC, we understand each other. That's what that post is saying. But then this is, a, this is useful, right? So the, the content strategy is what's useful, what's interesting, um, what's creative, what's purely for utility. Uh, and that's what Facebook, I think, is about, uh, and probably what you guys should be thinking about. Um, did one, something called last year called Nova Scotia for the win. And one of the fun things about working on the web is that you could crowdsource things, if you've heard that phrase. So I can, you can put up a website and ask other people to do something, to vote things up or down, or to get content. So you go there and you say, all it says is Nova Scotia news can be bleak, but there's lots to celebrate. What's something that you love about Nova Scotia? What do you love about living here? And you can enter 140 characters and click submit. It goes here immediately, and then you can vote them up or down. So we put this set up, and about two weeks, a thousand people had entered something. So I can talk more about this in particular, but um, it was interesting. Carolyn, you found, found it interesting when we were talking about this presentation. Um, 
in that you, you know, you're trying to reach a certain group of people who uh, love Nova Scotia but may be inundated by um, too much bad news. I think there was a particularly bad news week. And so it resonated with some people. When you get that, and here's my, I think my third component, and the concept of embracing data. When you get that, you get a thousand people saying what you love about Nova Scotia. If you're a tourism campaign, that's kind of interesting. So you can take that data set and you can look through it and see where, you know, what are the trends in content, what are the keywords. So just in a thousand folks, we did a, uh, we, this is what's called a word cloud. The bigger the word, the more frequently the word is used. So in terms of a focus group, a focus group that nobody visited physically, right? That's the other fun thing about the, the web. A focus group that was put up in a couple of days by a really good web developer. Um, a thousand people, and you can see the most frequently used word in a thousand posts was people, which is interesting. Um, and love, and bay, and lobster, and Peggy, and things like that. There was a really interesting battle in that data set of people from Home Bay and Picto County. Some Home Bay people were like tenacious that they were the best part, and then Picto County people were like, hell no, we're the best part. I love working on the web because embracing data, um, this kind of stuff would be impossible a couple of years ago. And this may seem like a grand scale thing, but um, just, you know, if we scale it back, I think uh, you'll see my point. A really interesting company took uh, the data set of all online ads of the top 10 toy manufacturers in the world. So I'll say that again. The top 10 toy manufacturers in the world, all the text used in their online advertising. So they took the data set. So these are all toys marketed to boys, the words most frequently to use. So toys marketed to boys globally, these are the words used in the ads. Cool, interesting? That's <laughs> so think about your own challenges. And you have to extrapolate here in this example. Are you going to go out tomorrow and do a big scale? No, it doesn't, and you don't need to do that. But my point is, um, data that you get is really fascinating and it guides your campaign and it's useful. And that was impossible uh, just a few years ago. Who's run the uh, race? I haven't. But it sounds really cool. Um, I hope to maybe next year. I have this in here. Um, I didn't work on this, but I find this really interesting. Uh, colleagues in my office helped kind of come up with the name, uh, I think the name and, and the, the logo uh, for the two notes. So I got to see some insider information. When, when the first the inaugural one started, people I know helped kind of tell the story of it. Uh, the, you know, the, the race for everyone, uh, not an elite race. Anybody can come and enter. Uh, they have, and they have a children's race. The thing that was interesting uh, to my point about embracing data is that on the registration form, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to. They said, why are you running? A simple question. And the, the, you know, the PR people, like me, were kind of saying, we need to have that question there. And the organizers were like, hell no, we don't need that question there. We just need a registration form. Why are you running is a really interesting question. So that produced a data set over, over time, about 20,000 submissions uh, or so over time, over all the, I think this has been running for years. And I, <coughs> so I, I kind of clamored and I got the data set. And so this is the word cloud of, uh, of why you were running with that data set. I thought you guys would find it interesting. Clearly, Marathon is the biggest work. Then when you have a data set and someone who knows how to play with data, uh, the web developer or someone like that, a technical person, access databases, uh, and you delete the most uh, obvious words, you get to see more insights. So when you extract things like Blue Nose and Marathon, the obvious words that everyone, like, why are you running, you get to see things like that. And, uh, and digital, that guides a digital strategy. Uh, with, with the ships campaign, we did something, uh, we, we collected stories, we made a word cloud, and then we posted the word cloud on Facebook and said, here's what you said. Um, that's a, the, the funny uh, infinite loop that happens here is that data that you get from data sets is really interesting to guide the campaign, then you can take that stuff make it public, show it to your audience, and they find it interesting and they share it, then you get more data, and then you get more stuff. And it's all about getting little pieces of stuff and making it shareable, really. That is either useful or interesting. Does that um, make sense? I'm 
just coming up. I think we're going to, I want to leave time at the end for your questions and stuff. One, one thing that I found really interesting about that campaign that you just referenced, the uh, What You Love About Nova Scotia, was that for a lot of us, we're trying to build that online database, if you will, from scratch. So it's one thing to develop a Facebook page or a Twitter account, but you start with zero followers. And one thing I like about it is it's a way to get a whole bunch of people having a really easy entry point so that you get a little bit of a database going and then you can, you know, it's kind of a starting point um, to kind of get the thing rolling. Exactly, like, like Canada Day Across America is so great. Uh, you know, one of the main, why are we doing this answers depends to the client is we'll get a better, we'll get a better email list because people want to have parties. <coughs> you do, right? So a very fundamental structure for an online campaign, someone said, I'm about, one of the questions was, I'm going to start an online campaign, what are the top five things? The structure of an online campaign for me is the most basic graph I can think of, is there's this discovery process where we try and figure out the story, you know, what is the, we build icons, what is the story, and you develop that into an anchor narrative, more language, basically. And then, you know, you think of your tactics, and then ongoing engagement, which is critical, like launching a website is, that's when you start, basically. Um, you're always coming back to the story touch points. So story touch points are kind of constantly coming back. Uh, I think I use this with recreation. Oh, let's go show um, for you. For some folks to know what this is, if you were in that. Um, here's an example of a story touch point. So for the Connect to Canada one, which is all about Canada's network in the United States, this URL, which you probably can't read, the URL is, is it Canada Day yet? That's the URL is a CanadaDayYet.com. And all the website does is do this. This is the entire website. Just said, so if you visit it now, this is what the website says. No. Um, we, so we took an hour, we had this idea, and we put up the website. This is actually a thing online called the single serving, single serving site. There's a name on this kind of website. It only does one thing. Um, and people thought it was, you know, our audience thinks that's funny. That's a story touch point. On Canada Day, it says yes, and, uh, Fire, like it's over the top garish, like fireworks go off and it plays automatically. And people share the hell out of this thing because they think it's funny. It's not really useful, but it's funny. And that's part of your challenge um, in digital media. Make it funny and interesting. That's a story touch point. Uh, every Facebook post is a story touch point. Every shareable object that you can find is a story touch point. It's a wonderful guy uh, named Jamie. Jamie. Well, there it is. Jamie in Ottawa, uh, who kept writing us on the Ship Start Here campaign and reinforcing that we got the story right whenever he wrote us, because he's like, I live in Ottawa, and we need to have a party in Ottawa at a bar when the award is given, and you need to give me lots of stickers. And we're like, okay, great. And he keeps writing, and we're like, we got to get this guy stickers. He's going to get angry. And so we work, and he's like, I need a big sticker for the hood of my car. So this is a car in Ottawa, and we sent him this gigantic sticker and he put it on his car and at the uh, he organized a pub uh, party for Nova Scotia after uh, and wrote all his friends and posted on Facebook so you know a lot of these things overlap but my nearly my shareable social object there's this photo for me as a campaign organizer um, my story touch point is also this photo and it manifests in a Facebook post that makes sense I all for a while. Final kind of really quick story. I had, a, I had a really boring, the most boring client I could ever imagine. They were all run by actuarial uh, accountants. So uh, if you are an accountant here, I apologize for my previous statement that I just said about four seconds ago. Um, they were the head of an organization that was uh, uh, only concerned about the US debt. And they came to us and said, this is going back before 2008, okay? So 2007, they were saying, we need people to care about the debt. And student debt was a way in, a more tangible way for people to care about it. So they had a really boring website with white papers, and no one was paying attention to it except other economists. So we convinced them to put up a website called fiscalhaiku.com. And we, you know, one point on this I, I wanted to make, I was thinking I was coming here, uh, design really matters. So if you look at this website, this is very like, it's not hard to imagine that this is about haikus, right? Japanese esoteric poetry. And there's a funny little picture here. Uh, and then you click this and you get the next haiku. Over all told, 
a few thousand people did this. At that time, about 475 people did it. We ran little Facebook ads targeting uh, universities around the United States um, of a certain age demographic. Because when you think about it, my mom is not the right demographic to write a fiscal haiku. My mom was like, well, you know, why would I? She would probably say, this is stupid. This, this is ridiculous. Why would I do this? Honestly, because I know my mom, that's what she, she would say. So when you think about this website, you can think about the person that sat around and wrote a haiku about their dad. You know, you, you have that demographic in your head. And so we targeted that demographic, and we put up this simple website, and we built a database. So of the, uh, every haiku, there's a little optional field that so give us your email address and we'll keep talking to you. We had about a 40% conversion rate on that. So say 1,000 haikus, you get uh, 400 email addresses that you didn't have before. <coughs> that's because it was created. Does that make sense? I won't stop you yet. We should allow some time. Yep. I don't know how much. Um, I'll just that one. Yeah. I'll get to the end really quickly. <laughs> My two slides here forgot emails. Uh, social uh, is the shiny, shiny object, and one of the reasons I was asked to, to come. Um, you often overlook the email. Email is not going away, it is just absolutely not. A critical piece of the Chips campaign was emails. Uh, we have a database of five or seven thousand, uh, uh, and we built it from scratch. Uh, in that, and that is that is the driver of most campaigns is still email, uh, because you can ask people to do things in email that they're not paying attention to on Facebook. So I, I would just say, don't forget about that. So we're moving to the question part now. I think um, with some final points. One easy way I think to structure if you're starting on this this path. It's good to look at your, your uh, website as your home base, and, and this, this sometimes helps clients. Your website is the home base, but the social properties you make around it uh, are kind of the satellite pieces. And those are all individually story touch points, and each of them are your own thing, but uh, <coughs> boys have their own activities, and have their own content, and tone, and manner as appropriate to, to the place. But, you know, it's good. I, I kind of find it's like understood this when I said it. This is one of your questions, so we're moving into in questions now. What is the most effective medium to keep your members informed? It's probably Facebook, because about, uh, I think, 58% of Canadians have a Facebook profile. <clears throat> Statistically alone, the biggest, um, the, not the elephant in the room, that's the wrong analogy, but the biggest thing in the room is Facebook. Statistically, people have, uh, how many people have a Facebook profile here? So your audience is going to be the same thing, or a little bit less, because you, you were Just on numbers alone, I would say go there. And enough. Yeah. Is there a is that organized demographically by gender by age? Well, if you're asking me like what's the demo demographic breakdown of Facebook, uh, there are really good sites called uh, All Facebook and InsideFacebook.com that give you really recent demographic da data. Uh, the, the things that stuck out to me this year was that this year. Canada is near the top in terms of active profiles. The, high, the fastest growing age group within Canada for a long time has been um, people 45 and up. So I've been joining Facebook at a rapid, rapid, the most rapid pace of adoption, 45 and up. Uh, the fastest pace of, of leaving it has been youth. So teenagers are kind of on to the next thing, I'm not really sure. But there was a lot of speculation like Facebook is, is going down. But people seem to even come back to it just because of uh, so many people are using it. It's kind of hard to go and start a new social network. And if you if you've had a Facebook profile, you, you know you've got say you've got 100 friends or 300 friends or what. Moving to something new is hard, and so um, the barrier to doing that is high. So I think it's a safe bet. But demographic data is available. If you were to select one area to get started, what would it be, and what were your three best strategies? So, you know, the story stuff is all fine and can, but give me like, give me, give me, a, give me a tactic. Give me, what would you do right now? So, I think story is really important. Uh, I find this table really useful. This kind of grid, walk through each column, column here. First is like organize your thoughts. So, on the left is audience, what your audience thinks, what I want my audience to think. What gets them from two to three? And then what are the possible digital tactics that can do that? 
I'm, I love getting organized in terms of my thoughts. And this is like one of the things that I, I will literally use with mine to help get me there. So if my audience is recent graduates, you know, and, and I think that they're thinking, or I have, a, I have data that tells me this, survey data, I can't start a new sport now. I've played basketball since grade six. I can't start soccer now. But you want them, you want them to understand that, you know, we know it's go through their program three. You can start a new sport at any age, so you want them to do. So the creative exercise starts here, right? Like what 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 do you think gets a recent graduate to move from column two to column three? And then what are the actual digital tactics that may make that come to life? So a creative digital tactic would be Nova Scotia for the win. You know, you know, I want to tell the story. I want to engage Nova Scotians who are sick of bad news and want to say something really good about Nova Scotia. And I want to create a data set and I want to use that data set to talk to other people that are thinking of visiting here. That's, that's, that fits into that table. Um, the digital tactic became something like that, which is somewhat creative. I mean, there's voting and things like that. But it doesn't have to be. This could be a content piece, right? Um, is this confusing? You guys, is this useful? For me, it, it has been historical in terms of organizing thoughts. Because I, I said, the, the best thing you can do when you're working with a communications person is say, you know, clearly articulate the problem. That is not necessarily saying I want everybody to know about what I'm, I want everyone, I want all enough students to know this. So that is a somewhat actionable problem. A more actionable problem is that we've got some, uh, uh, our numbers for senior citizens signing up for Recreation classes in Nova Scotia have been plummeting for the past three years. Help us think about that. That's something I can sink my teeth into a little bit better. So the first thing I would say is get your thoughts organized and what you're really trying to do. Then I would say if the visual tactics are okay, I want to start Facebook and Twitter, or your or your um, if you're working with someone who's saying you need a Twitter page or something like that, uh, write. Don't go out and start it. See if you can write a dozen entries on each platform that's appropriate to the platform. That's all really useful. So, particularly if you're going to start a blog. So, okay, we need a lacrosse blog. Okay, what are, go write 12 posts on, on lacrosse in Nova Scotia. It's hard. It's pretty hard to do. Uh, content's not easy. Three, realize uh, the third thing. Realize what is useful and interesting to your audience. Oh, I, I was someone wrote a question about lacrosse and it stuck in my head, and I visited the lacrosse website. That's why I keep picking up lacrosse. So, realize what is useful and interesting to your audience. Audiences like the 365 things to do in DC. Like, what if what if you were kind of like, I'm just brainstorming. What if your approach was less? I, I need to get in front of people who have, uh, uh, people who already play lacrosse and I have their database. What if it's more like, you know, there are a lot of people that love lacrosse in Nova Scotia and they're already on mailing lists. I want to curate information for them globally of really interesting lacrosse stories and photos. That's a Facebook strategy. Is it a good one? I don't know. I just made it up. But it's, it's an idea. Um, and, 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 you know, something like that is, becomes an approach. Uh, what is useful and what's interesting? These five questions have served me uh, very, very well. Uh, they're not as tactical as you, as you may like. They're very obvious. But I'd like to know how to start a social media campaign is the question. What are the top five things that need to be accomplished to be successful from the start? From the start is a key point. Uh, I want to know who you're trying to reach. Everyone is not an answer, not an acceptable answer. What do you want them to do? So on the ship's campaign, I wanted to reach, initially, I wanted to reach shipyard workers and have them be my key evangelists, my amba ambassadors for the message, because they were the most likely to pay attention to me. Then once we got the story right, we started to think, well, I want um, students who want to stay here. I want parents who don't want their kids to move away. I want um, expats. Uh, like the dude in Ottawa, um, you, you get that refined. So who are you trying to reach? You break down the audiences. What do you want them to do? What help? What content helps them do that thing? I want to put a pin on a map supporting uh, shipbuilding Nova Scotia. I want them to tell me their story about Canada Day because I want their email address really bad. Um, what do you want them to do? And what is the content that makes them do that? Develop your story and start. Start with why is hard to complain. Hard to explain. In Press time, right? But the best stories explain like, why you do something, not what it is. What it is is the National Shipbuilding Recurrent Strategy. Why is we build life? 
and then you go from there. <laughs> so five is pretty uh, ambiguous. Okay, almost finished actually my slides. And more questions? Uh, I think I have another one here. Um, the most read nonprofit digital person on the planet is Beth Cantor. Uh, Beth is great. So if you're like, you know, she wrote a book called Network Nonprofit, and her blog has been active for a dozen years. And uh, she's great. If you're like, where do I start? Go to her blog, start searching, searching for what you're interested in. Read her book, Network Nonprofit. Because I met when Carolyn and I talked. Uh, Carolyn and I talked. It was a. I feel like there's a, an L. You know, the, I was thinking, and this could be wrong, but I'm projecting like a nonprofit uh, uh, problem set when I when I talk to you. So uh, Beth, I think, is really useful and creative, and I've and I've, I've actually sent Beth to corporate clients as well. So kind of a tangible thing I would take away from that. One of the things this is really out of date, but this is Beth's chart, Beth Cantor's chart of time investment. So a digital strategy, you know, there's often listen instead of like just going to bat with all your, this is not about a monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring talk, but you know, listening to what's going on in the world, and then you participate, and then you try and generate buzz and share content and community building. So I want to participate in the lacrosse conversation. It's not that hard, but uh, in terms of a week, you are going to spend hours doing that, to be clear. So you'll do five to six hours a week probably participating. That's responding to people on Twitter, listen, seeing what people, you post on Facebook and eight people ask you a question, you should answer. If you don't answer, you can just shot yourself in the book. So there is a, a this, is, this is in a week. So if you say, I want to build a community, a really vibrant community, uh, her estimate was around 20 hours a week for someone's time. Uh, I think that varies, and this is out of date because Ning was a bot, and I wouldn't ever think about MySpace anymore. <laughs> it's pretty much bankrupt. So this is an old chart from Beth Cantor, but it served me really well in terms of I just didn't get a chance to update. I think it's accurate in terms of time investment. I'll skip that. And uh, final final thoughts um, in terms of what I think you with. I think the question who you're trying to reach is really really useful. Uh, what do you want them to do? Who can influence and persuade them to act? Whether it be you know, Muppets, joining Star Wars. I think it's really useful. Find a story, find a narrative anchor. If you are going to go out and start a Facebook page, you won't know, what, know why. Would you join that Facebook page? Why? <laughs> you know, that's a really good question to ask. Uh, listen and pay attention is really useful. They're very cheap, non-monetary ways on uh, ways, uh, free ways, monetary, free ways to, to set up Google Alerts and say, give me posts globally about, uh, about lacrosse. Google Alerts can do that for free. You'll get an email every day from Google saying, uh, here are all the posts in the world about lacrosse. That's, that's interesting. And you can curate that information. Uh, reading Beth's blog is one of those things. Uh, Embracing data, I think I've made that point. That chart behind me, uh, I said this at the recreation conference. Someone took all of the Facebook data for uh, words, all of the Facebook data for words that indicated uh, the end of a relationship, a breakup, uh, globally. So globally, anything that had anything to do with breaking up. And then you could chart the best times of year uh, to break up with someone. <laughs> <laughs> kind of why I love working in this was the web. This is really interesting, right? So if you're like, you know, maybe people at a certain time of year then need to pick up a sport, or this is when they buy roses more often. You know, that's that's why that data is interesting. It is a lot about a lot of small moves, um, and don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. If you're thinking about social, I think writing you should do things like write the next six to twelve posts before you you know invest time in a blog. But uh, I just really like that quote. It isn't rocket science, but it isn't super, super easy. I think story is really uh, vital and useful and interesting is vital. And I think that's my final thought. So thanks for listening, but I can have more open questions. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so I think what we'll do is whoever wants to stick around and pick his brains, <laughs> um, please do. For those of you that have to leave. Please feel welcome to do that as well. This is the first, I'll just say quickly, this is the first in our Subway series. Today is the first one that we've 
uh, pulled off. There will be others that will follow, so I'll send notes around as they're booked. And um, Kevin needs stuff in Butter High, so I don't know how we're going to do it in the ensuing sessions, but I certainly learned a lot today. Uh, Ross Parks is with us today. He's the regional manager for Subway, and Subway has graciously sponsored this series for us, so uh, Ross, if you want to um, say a word, then we'd be. Thanks, girl. Uh, on behalf of all the stores in Nova Scotia, it's uh, thanks to Jeff and the crew for letting us expand this Subway Seminar Series. It's fantastic. And Kevin, uh, it's funny that you should mention uh, Jared because we have a shirt uh, right from his... Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I think it was for Nova Scotia shirt. 